Okay, so the topic today, I'm not sharing my screen yet, am I? Let me share my screen. The topic today... Um, here, let me put this up so you can see it. Is about the idea of creating an adaptive framework in a Q and A on Amplio, and I got two two things I want to talk about to start with. One is, uh, I'll admit maybe some frustration in general at what I consider to be the insanity of consultants, uh, in no particular uh, brand, <laughs> uh, just in general. And that's been and brought up basically because of this topic that I find it interesting that uh, Amplio has to make the notion that you should diagnose your system before you try to fix it. To me, that seems so obvious. I was trying to write about this last night as a prep for this. And to be honest, I was absolutely stymied on how to write about it. Because I was thinking, well, I should just write about it. And then I was thinking, well, I should actually talk about why not doing it makes a mistake, is a mistake. But then it's like, well, that's just so weird to even have to say that. And then it made me realize, well, this is just crazy. And um, I know where this comes from. It comes from when we started Agile, and people don't seem to recognize this. When we started Agile, we knew it worked, but I don't think people understood why it worked. Okay. I'm talking like 99, 2000. XP was really a godsend, it felt like, to developers, but only to those developers that kind of were willing to do what it took to get quality code, you know, which was paired programming and test first. And most didn't want to do that. Why? Because they, um, didn't like to pair. Look, let's be candid. Most, a lot, I won't say most, a lot, but I think it's most. Developers got into development so they could be with their computer more than with other people. That's certainly why I got into it. Uh, I just had a life-changing event in the 80s that made me like being with people more. But, you know, for 13 years, I was like that. I just liked where I could just work and plug away. And I like to think I can figure stuff out and do it on my own. So then when Agile came, one of the things that I think is really problematic is that Agile talks about self-organization and developers get to do what they want. And the reality is, no, it's not right. It isn't. It isn't right. You don't get to do crap. What it means is you just shouldn't be imposed on. Doing what you want and not being imposed on are two different things. And I've been meaning to write something because I keep getting asked by Dan Mesick, who's in charge of that open leadership thing or whatever. And I find that ironic because here you got on the front page of the open leadership, which is talking about not being imposed on. You've got one of the people who've done more imposition on more people than anybody else, or one of the two, Ken Schwaber being the other one. And I'm talking about Jeff Sutherland. Scrum has been imposed on people more than any other framework in existence. And impose is the right word to use. So there's a kind of level of insanity out there where it's just hard to break. It's an echo chamber that's that deflects over and over again. And this topic is one of those that just doesn't even seem to be looking at is why have a framework that doesn't change? And I'm not talking just about Scrum. Look at safe, look at less. If you've got a framework, it's not changing. That's why I talk about an adaptive framework. Well, that's weird. What the hell is an adaptive framework? Because when people talk about frameworks, there are frameworks that don't change and there are frameworks that do change. Like I, people have said, well, physics is a framework. And I would say, yes, you know, it is a framework because physics gives you a mindset to come from. It gives you a place to think about. It gives you constraints that it believes are the reality of the situation. Like, you know, if anybody sells, tries to sell me an invention of the laws of thermo that violate the laws of thermodynamics, I'm a little dubious. Um, I mean, I'd be open to it if they could do proof. But, you know, if anybody could break the laws of thermodynamics, they would demonstrate that right out front for free because they would win a Nobel Prize. They'd get a lot of money. They'd get all the funding they wanted for the invention. They wouldn't have to be selling it. So... 
there are constraints you have to follow, but that should be the laws of physics, or in our case, um, the physics of flow, as I, I can't remember if it was Peter Merrill or Wolfram Mueller, I first heard it, and I talk about it as flow, lean theory, constraints, oh. and that. Yeah, Patrick, did you have something or just uh, just muttered something? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. So I'll admit I've been kind of in this quandary a little bit, and I think it's important to look at, and I'm kind of starting to lose uh, much confidence that there's going to be a shift here. I'm not losing confidence in what I'm doing. I'm actually delighted with what's going on in Amplio University now. It's just got me thinking about things. And, you know, as as I keep quoting from, as I keep quoting from, um, Marcus Aurelius, the, you know, the obstacle is the way it actually can't defeat us. We have to keep looking at it. So I guess that's what I'm talking. And <laughs> I'll apologize in advance for a 10 minute ramble. That's probably not what you get here, but that's, I just need to put this into perspective because I think this is part of the whole issue and Hey, this is the ACOP. So I feel I can do a little bit what I want to <laughs> just to be candid. Um, and for your aces, I think those people are in the employee university because we're mixed here. I think this is an important conversation because the question is, how do you get out of the history, what I call cognitive inertia? I'm sure that's a real term somebody else has used as well. I don't think I invented that. You know, just this thinking inertia that we just keep going. And one of the things is that we have to look at what do we attend to? What do we not attend to? And how do we move forward and how do we do that? And you need a framework. Actually, I, I've resisted this for a long time, I know. But last week or the week before we talked about it, Amplio really does create a framework. It does it by having all these capabilities and then picking which ones you're going to use and then how you're going to solve them with patterns that provide the means. And that was a really good session. So. The difference, though, is the framework I'll put in quotes. Amplio has two frameworks here, and I want to explain that as a pre precursor. So I am on topic. I'm just rambling, I'll admit. The first framework is a thinking framework. You can call it the Amplio thinking framework. Flow, theory of constraints, lean, and, uh, and human-centered development. That's the other weird thing. We talk about people over process, but then we don't say much about people anymore other than let them go off and do their thing and ignore whether they're doing it the right way or not. I remember years ago, and I still think this is true. This was like, I, I can't remember exactly, about 2006, something like that. When I had a, at one time I had an, a nearshoring um, company I was in partnership with. And it was a Velocity Partners, and uh, it didn't work well for a couple of reasons, but I won't go into but I remember thinking, and I almost did this, was I was of the opinion, I'm still of the opinion, that if you took a bunch of hotshot programmers and let them do what they wanted, but they weren't really doing code, uh, using like the code complete idea or, you know, uh, Bob Martin's uh, uh, design, the way he talks about it, because I really like his technical stuff or like what David Bernstein and I talk about with patterns. That if you took an experienced group of people that they like to do it their own way, I bet you I could outperform them if I hired a bunch of offshore, less expensive people who had little experience. But I told them, look, you guys have to do tests first. You have to pair. You have to build incrementally. I don't care if you don't like it. And if it slows you down, that's fine. I'm fine. I'm not going to give you any grief for following how to do this. I bet you they would outperform the experienced people. I have no doubt of this, actually. I regret not having run the experiment years ago when it could have cost me only about fifty to $100,000. It would have been worth doing. But I'm still convinced it's right. Why? Because when you do the wrong thing, you're stuck in it. When you do the right thing poorly, you learn. And this is a key insight. I mean, I'm. how many people have said that? Everybody I respect, basically. So it's not a new insight. But I'm going to say it again. When you're really smart doing the wrong thing, trying to get better and better. It's almost like the curse of knowledge because you say, damn it, I've done, I can solve this problem. And you buckle down and you do that. And I've had that experience. I remember in the seventies and eighties, my God, 
when I made a mistake, man, that wasn't going to stop me. And one of the key things I learned programming in the 70s and early 80s was how to tell when my head was down and I was pushing against a brick wall. I'd call it a rat hole. And eventually, it took about a year or two, I would notice when I was going down a rat hole within a day or two. Okay, With Agile, you notice it. You don't even go down rat holes, actually, if you do it right. So there is this question I have about breaking this. And uh, I'm just going to put that as a background because I don't know. I'm, actually, before I go into it, I don't know if you guys have any ideas because I think this is really one of the – it's this it's this disempowering beliefs that's out there that are so ingrained. I'll give you one example. It probably started this. Yeah, Susan, and then I'll give this other example. Well, one thing that occurs to me is that uh, there's a couple of things. One is that people crave solutions. So if yes. someone tells them this framework is the solution to whatever problem you happen to have, uh, some of them will believe that or they'll at least try it. And the other is that if you're trying hard and you're not succeeding, it's because you're a victim of something or other. And it must be somebody else's fault. It couldn't be that you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Well, see, this is this you're you're actually hitting part of the problem that I'm trying to address is people like solutions. So I do think you need to give them solutions. But you need to give solutions that people don't get trapped in. That's the idea of an adaptive framework. In other words, give them a framework, yes. give them something that can change, not something they can abandon. This is also, it's like, wait a moment. I've heard this so many times, like, oh, well, Scrum's a good starting point. Well, first of all, I doubt it. But second of all, even if it is, then why do I have to abandon it once I'm ready to go to something else? That's ridiculous. That avoids the human, that avoids thinking about the human nature. Once you have once you've decided to go that way, it's hard to break from it. It's funny. I talked about how I can improve safe with this really strain engineer track I've added now into Ample University, which is actually no you, new information. It's just basically a collection of all the pieces in AU that you know I've used in the past. I mean, a lot of the ideas that are in Ample University came from when I was fixing safe for two years as an SBCT and consultant back in 2012 and 2014. Uh, but the the idea is that where you start, you want to just keep able to go. This so I anyway I was writing about the Amplio RTE, and somebody said uh, sunk costs, and I was like thinking, well, yes and no. First of all, if you've made an investment in something like Safe, fixing it is not sunk costs because you're not getting you're not continuing to stay in safe it might still look that way but you've improved it you're adding to it i don't care what you call it as far as i'm concerned it's safe i don't care what you call it i remember one time uh, there's this guy i'd trained in years and years ago this was like 10 years ago and or maybe not that long but almost and i trained him years before that at a, he was at a client of mine and he'd gotten some the basic i had a system i called flex back then flow for lean enterprise transformation with net objectives and i knew he was doing safe or he said he was doing safe or his company said he was doing safe and we were just chatting amicably about things he said well you know we don't really do safe we do what you taught us but we call it safe because that's what management paid for uh, so they did safe as you know, they did an SBC training and then they just added my stuff to it. And you have bigger room planning and you have all the, the things that look like safe. So they just call it safe. And it is in a sense, it's just not fixed, fixed as, as a uh, static. So, so this is kind of the idea is that, oh, the sunk cost. So if you're sticking with say, but see, this is something interesting to realize as well. And it's again, why you need an adaptive framework. Let's say you started with Scrum and it worked brilliantly. See, you change. Let's say you started with safe and it worked brilliantly. Who's to say that the way, what you morph into in two or three years is still going to be appropriate for the frameworks you started out with. It's they're not, even if it's the right thing to start with, it's not going to be the right thing in two or three years. Not if it's helping you. That's what people tend to forget, that companies are not static and they can't have static frameworks. And static frameworks typically aren't right to begin with, but even if somehow through some miracle they were, 
they wouldn't be good for long. Have you been a company? Well, I guess if you've had companies that never change, but then what's the whole point? You know what I'm saying? Then you're then they're not being effective either. You know, it's funny. Scrum says, well, we're changing the organization to be more effective. Great. So then what do you do once they are? Where do you go next? This is the other key thing that hits me. This is one of the differences between um, between theory of constraints and say Reinhardson and uh, and and Lean. And, and thank you, uh, <clears throat> Vanessa. One of our aces has been putting some great questions on the Lean uh, on the, on the uh, the uh, LinkedIn group for the ACE program. Uh, which is public, by the way. But there's a reason I put flow, I say flow, lean, and theory of constraints, because they're all compatible, but how you implement the theory of flow, lean, and theory of constraints is quite different. And flow to me is the primary driver, flow of value. Take an economic model. I'm a big believer in Don Reinertson. I joke, but it's true. It's, there's, well, maybe it wasn't 100 to nothing, but let me tell you, it was at least 20 times where he and I would have a disagreement. Now, what, what that means is I'd read something in Don's book and I didn't understand it and it seemed wrong. And I would try to resolve it in my head. I was pretty close with Don at one point. I would, we just drifted apart, nothing bad. I love Don. Uh, and I would talk to him when we'd get together at a conference and I said, Don, I don't understand this. I see this and that. And we'd discuss it and I would tell him why I thought it might not be right. And he's always, he would just laugh and talk to me. He's very amicable guy i love him and every time he was right <laughs> i so the score is probably 20 to nothing but i joke about it being 100 to nothing but so i'm very much in, ingrained in his thought process in fact sometimes i think oh here's writing about me here <laughs> about misunderstandings so flow of value is the key this is also consistent with tom gilb's evo model of values first but see, lean, the key thing about lean, and I've been studying lean since the 80s, so it's not a new concept for me. But I'll admit it wasn't until about 10 years ago that it really hit me what lean is about in a nutshell. I can say it in three words, four words, continuous learning to improve. That's it. That's the essence of lean, continuing learning to improve. And the rest is how you do it. So this idea of fixing things, fixing problems, is actually limiting in a weird way because what happens when the problems go away? What happens when you're already doing better than everybody else? Well, we're doing good enough. That's why Agile's good enough has always bothered me. No. You say good enough to somebody who makes pacemakers, which I did once. and I learned my lesson. This is a long time back. And they said, no, you put a good enough pacemaker in a guy and they're dead. You can never be good enough. There's always cases you have to be looking for. So this is this is the, the disempowering belief stuff that I think is killing us and holding this industry back. And I think this is one of the key ones. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for more questions and then we'll get into this a little bit. How does how does Amplio do this? Are we good? Okay, because I think this is key. So, so Al, oh, yeah. I do have um, a question oh, um, related to what you're <laughs> mentioning. That's um, great. So I, it's regarding a flow, no? What you answered in the um, the, the group that yeah. so the reference that you have of flow is um, Donald Raymond. No, I didn't know that he was the reference of flow. So. Yeah, no, that's that's where. So I had an interesting conversation with him once about this. So Don, that's your reference from. That's I mean, my reference. This from yeah. Don. This book. Now here's the story. Okay. There, I'll tell you the story. This was around. Let's see. This came out in 2009. So I had been a fan of Don from another book. Uh, Managing the Design Factory, okay? Now, I took a long time to read this book because uh, we're not a design factory. I didn't like the title. I'll admit, this was my mistake. 
And I read it around 2001. And the reason I, I mean, I, mean, I read it around, um, oh shit, when did I read this? I read this, I didn't read it when it came out. I read it years later, probably around 2008 or nine. Brilliant book. And I remember thinking, wow, it's now almost 10 years old, but he's still 10 years ahead of everybody else. Brilliant book. So when I heard, so that's how I got a hold of him. I, I knew him from that book and somehow we started connecting. And I, I did ask him once why he liked talking to me <laughs> because it was always, I was learning from him. He didn't seem to be learning much from me. Uh, and I don't think I've really, I don't know if I've ever taught him anything, but he just said he liked talking to somebody who was open-minded and he enjoyed the conversations. And I do that too. So I actually can appreciate that. Uh, uh, Tom Gilb, I think, is that way, too. He likes the conversations. Uh, now he's actually starting to learn from me, but it's been about three, it took about a year or two before that started to happen. Uh, but I, there are two clues here. So he kept talking. If you go to his conferences, he doesn't seem to do many of them now, but he used to go to a lot of conferences, and I was at most of them that he was at. And he would talk about lean, but he would talk about he learned more about lean or what to do about flow of value by looking at network systems, the way they handle networks. I mean, the internet and things like that. You know, the flow of information, the distributed models mm -hmm. they use, where you had decision points where, you know, this is the whole thing where computers decide what, the individual computers decide what to do with a coordinated set of decisions that manage the whole system. And I had been starting to think about that flow was more important than lean was about the time I got this book and we started talking and he helped me. He helped me bridge from lean. See, 15 years ago, I would have said, well, I do lean flow and theory of constraints because the first principle from Womack and Jones of lean is flow or it's value rather it's value, uh, uh, you know, value stream, uh, flows in there, but you know, it's not the first one, but I said, you know, there's a clue here. Flow is in the title. Lean is in the subtitle. What does that imply? It implies flow is senior. So Reinertsen likes, Reinertsen likes lean. He likes the learning. He likes the continuous education. He likes the systems thinking, but flow is the primary. And that's why I always say flow, lean, and then theory constraints. And why theory constraints last? Because theory constraints brings in the human nature of things. I still think the best book on the theory of constraints, but it's hard to say really because I read them in the in this order. Uh, uh, I still think this is the most definitely for where people are now. This is the most impactful book of Reinhardt's of, of Goldratt's I've read. Now, if you don't know anything about Agile, then maybe the goal is a good one. But to be candid, if you didn't know anything about Agile, the best introduction would be would be uh, uh, his daughter's recent book, Rules of Flow. This is a great introduction to this whole thing. It's fabulous. takes two hours to read. It's a complete distillation, and it's an engaging story. So it's good. So yeah, so there are these layers of things. The point is people still take gold rats. There's gold rats thinking and then there's how it's people have used it. You got to recognize there's this core thinking and then how people use it may not be right. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Reinertsen, except Reinertsen is so clear it's kind of get obvious when people use it wrong. Yeah, Vanessa, it's something else. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Yeah, you basically cleared. Um, yeah, so this is good. And, and here's something to... I, I've said this should be on the this is on the ACOP page, but I'm going to try to put more emphasis on getting questions here. This is just where my groups are. It's this ACE consultant. I still call it the Amplio Consultant Educators because the idea was uh you know, I'll put this in the chat. When when the ACE program started, it was about making really good consultants better, but it's since expanded to having just, it's there's so much material now and now calling it Ample University and ACEs probably will want to take about 80 or 90% of the curriculum, but other people might want to come in just for 20% of the curriculum. But this is where you can ask me questions. And I hate to be a little 
I was thinking about not answering questions one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm trying to leverage myself and focus on this. I do think we can change the world. I really do. Agile changed the world to some extent and then fell flat for a variety of missing foundations. I'm trying to be more holistic and complete and leverage people. Anyway, then we'll come back to this. Any other comments or I'm going to get into this? Okay. Hopefully this was helpful to you. It's helped me a lot because I my problem was, and I'm still not sure how I'm going to write about this, but some of the things I said in the last half hour, hour, whatever, half hour, are these key points is we have to diagnose. We have to know what we are. People need, they need a set guidance. It's just how most people are. Now, I don't need that. And some of you don't need that. But in general, at least 80%. It's not so much that they want to follow. Maybe 40% want to follow. There are some people who just want to follow this. You could... You could say these are the late majority and the laggards, and they do want to follow, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Linda Rising made a brilliant, I got to dig this out. This was like, oh, I was, <laughs> she she undercut my thinking so well in this talk about how resistance is a really good thing. We would not have survived as a species if we didn't have it. It would have been, oh, look at those interesting berries. Let's go eat them. And somebody says, well, I don't know. Let's try it out. Oh, too bad Tom died on that. You know, those berries were poisonous. I mean, sometimes resistance can be a positive thing. And she lays this out in a talk. So it's not like resistance that bothers me. It's this kind of not considering things. But anyway, it's this moving forward that's an important thing. So anyway, let's come back in. So people need, we need different kinds of people. We need followers. We need leaders. We need people who are cutting edge. It's not like everybody should be leading. I mean, it's not like everybody wants to. That's that's my point. It's not even good for everybody to do that. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, perhaps one additional thing that you could point out is the, the adaptive framework uh, distinguishes its, itself by having an error correction mechanism or at least a culture that is open to, to better suggestions, right? You often point out that we, we learn together uh, to, to find better ways, right? And right. whenever you get to a framework that is fixed and static, that has some sort of dogmatic ground rules that you cannot challenge, then uh, you, you're in for some problems. And That's right. And one, one could draw other analogies there. I recently heard something from uh, Noah Harari about, uh, you know, for example, the, the U.S. Constitution is written by humans. They were fallible, so they included an error correction mechanism. And yeah, has helped it in the long run. Yeah. But there are other texts, which we don't need to go into, that um, don't have that. And they, they need to be uh, accepted as they are without error correction mechanism. And that creates some fundamental problems. Yeah, I really like this. And it actually gives me an insight about something I was struggling with this morning. There's been a discussion on LinkedIn by a couple of people where one person was talking about incremental value and and um, thin store, thin slices of value. And I'm reading this and I'm saying, this sounds great. And then I realized because he says he's talking about stories. And I made this comment. This was a great post until you mentioned stories. And, and then we got into a discussion and it's not like I disagree with him, but there's something I realized he misses. And I just kind of disengaged out of the conversation because I realized that there are things people don't see in the agile space. And, and sometimes I just get so triggered by it. I can't see it. Well, uh, I mean, I can't respond to it well, but I realized what it is, is yes, incremental value of stories. Stories do add value, but that's not the kind of value I'm talking about. There are two levels of value. Or actually, there are many levels of value. One level of value I'm talking about when I talk about values first, when borrowing it from Tom Gilbstow, you know, values first, what are the success criteria of the critical stakeholders and what are their constraints? Because they have money constraints or government constraints, things of that. Is there's deliverable value, then there's incremental value to get to the deliverable value, then there's value of understanding. There are like four or five levels of value. And What's always interesting to me is when people when people um, talk about this and they think I don't understand, they say, well, then they laid out. I said, yeah, I, I mentioned that 15 years ago. I mean, the problem with talking about things 15 years ago is nobody remembered you said them and that maybe you understand what you're talking about. Um, 
you know, it took, it took what, Ken, 13 years to acknowledge that Scrum and Lean might have some relationship, but he still kind of sidesteps that. So this brings up an interesting thing. I was going to wait till after I went through this, but I'm going to say it now. Because I've been in this dilemma, and I, I'm going to mention a shift in the ACOP. I've been trying to figure this out. There's something here I'm not happy with. I've been happy with what we've done, and I've been happy with y'all. I want to be, you, you haven't disappointed me. I don't want it to be that. My original intention was the ACOP was to kind of put some of this stuff out in the world so people could see there are other ways of doing it. And I do appreciate sometimes you let me just ramble like this and double your money back offer still holds. So no worries there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the problem is, is that I kind of did the foundations and I'm kind of satisfied with that. And I'm kind of was trying to figure out where to go next. Okay. But we've been getting a kind of a little bit of a resurgence of people in the Amplio University, which I'm glad to see. And that's raised another problem. We did fix an onboarding. How do people come in and catch up? But I also see that the catch up process, as I have envisioned it of being slow, is not as good as it might be. And um, so it's occurred to me, in fact, that some of this was suggestions from within the organization. And Vanessa was one of them doing this. And I love these suggestions. I'd been thinking along these lines, but I hadn't thought it all the way through. Like in the in the uh, university, <clears throat> excuse me, in the university, I do have uh, I do have what I call foundations, which is what we did here. See, th this is really good. Go to Ample University, the curriculum. We, these are all the videos that we've done for the last several months here, but I'm done with that. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. And the idea was one of the things we need, and I thought about this, but I hadn't really thought it as clear until Vanessa gave me this good input, is there is a core set of things that everybody, it's like in a university, you know, you always have, these are your fundamentals that you have to do. Now, ironically, most of those are listed here in the Amplio RTE because... <clears throat> Basically, I'm just saying, if you know how to be a good consultant, you can be a really good RTE. Okay, so I've got them there. But I was thinking about that this morning. And I was making a list of them. And it occurred to me, I'm trying to balance things here. I'm trying to occur to me, I, I want to keep doing the ACOP. And it needs to be a useful part of Amplio University at the same time. So what I'm going to be doing going forward, and I think you'll like this because this uh, actually helps y'all is I'm going to start, I'm going to look at this core and I'm going to start doing it in the ACOP because these are things people need to know. And they're not, they're already out there, you know, driving from values first. I get this from Tom Gill. The diagnostic is the GPS and to at least give you an idea of what it is. Uh, I've already got that. Uh, we're going to do this in the next 20 minutes. I don't need, but 15 to do it. Okay. Uh, We've talked about these other things. This is very critical. So this is what triggered this was this morning. So they're talking about all this stuff. And in the agile space, everything is backwards. Not everything, sorry. But if you're based on Scrum, and most is, less safe Scrum, it pervades logic. You come from stories and build them up. See, actually, safe tries to trick, flip this which is one of the good things about it. It actually talks about product management and coming from that, but then they mess it up by not having the equivalent of what's the next thing you can deliver that's small. They took the term that had that, uh, Denny and Khalil and Wang's minimum marketable feature, but then they changed, they kept the name, changed what it meant, keep the reference back to the book. So that totally screws it up because now people don't know what that thing is. And that's where the MVIs are important. But these these are things that are missing. Anyway, so I'm going to be changing the ACOP. I'm going to make the core curriculum things that if people have in the, been in the Amplio University program for a few months have already had. I'm going to redo it, do it over. And that's what Tuesday will be. And that'll be like a catch-up track for anybody who comes into Amplio University late is they can come to the Tuesday sessions and know that's how they can catch up. And I think it'll be useful for everybody else uh, in the program because it's always worth seeing some of these things twice, plus we'll get better materials too. So that's my plan for how the ACP is going to go forward. And that's also a bit of an announcement to the uh, ACEs or AU people in this program. Okay, so let's do this. Let's talk about this. Are there any questions about that? Okay, well then let's talk about this.
Okay, so Amplio and Amplio University are, are intertwined. You could think of Amplio as the system and Amplio University as the explanation for the system and how you use Amplio. It's how you learn. And one of the things we've been talking about is we have this thing we call GPS. A global positioning system is the metaphor. I used to call this the generic value stream. In fact, it uses a generic value stream. What do I mean by that? I'm not sure I've got these in the right order. So let me, no, I do. Well, it's close. Oh, duh, I forgot. There's this thing called hyperlinks. You, you know that? They're really cool. And you can tell when there's one because there's another one. <laughs> I told you we had defective coffee in Seattle. I warned you. Okay. So the idea of the of the GPS using what I consider what I consider like a generic value stream. This is the term I used with the uh, in the discipline agile value stream consultant. This was something I created in 2019 that I thought would people be able to if you walk through this. In fact, I should. I should actually be showing, I should pull this up. I got to merge these. I put things in different files so I can find them more easily. Rather, you know, there's not one huge deck. There are different ways to use this. Uh, the way I used to do it, and so I'm going to, I'm going to use it here. The way I used to do it is I would say, let, we're gonna, I wouldn't have all that on the left. That was for the consultants. I would say, we wanna focus on success. We identify what the success criteria is. These are different things we should do. Now you don't need to know how, they, they know what I mean by critical stakeholders or by the, what are the, we, what are our strategies? What are the things we're investing in? So, you know, I ask, how are we doing with this? And then I just kind of keep going out and saying, well, are you budgeting right? What's your strategies? And they would identify where they weren't doing it well. They don't know how to do it right yet. I don't want to ask them about that. But we we'll go through this one step at a time. I'd do this at a big whiteboard before I, you know, before I had this. The thing is, I don't actually go on site a lot now. So I, I when I did, I'd use a whiteboard, but this works reasonably well and you could sticky on it. And what we have here is I'm using, this is what I call the generic value stream. In other words, each this, this flow model and these capabilities that are there are things you have to do. And people kind of recognize these. So take a minute, look on this, because this is another value Oops, of this. Is, is there anything on here that you don't quite understand what I mean. MVRs is probably up to minimum viable releases. The reason I make a distinction between minimum valuable increments, which is what you can create, is sometimes you glom them together. You know, like you might glom them together. Maybe, maybe the company, the excuse me, maybe your customers are used to having quarterly releases. So you might build MVIs, get some feedback from them, but chunk them together to actually release them. So that's why we have that distinction. Okay, the thing is, I would suggest that almost all of these are people understand what you mean. They may not know what you mean by effective domain skills, but they have a sense of what effective domain skills are. Oh, we're not getting good feedback. You know, we don't know how to prioritize, things like that. So the GPS uses this idea of a generic value stream. Now, this is an insight that, uh, myself and uh, our other top consultant at the time, well, he was always when he was there, the top consultant, we both had separately. And I like it when different people come up with the same idea independently of each other. It would have been more efficient if he told me because he had figured it out first, but he had it. That if you looked at a hundred different accounts, 80% of them would have 80% of their problems would be the same. So there were always some offshore, off, 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 uh, you know, whatever you call them, out, outliers. Actually, I'd say it was more like 95% of them would have 90% the same problems. I don't know why I say 80, 80, because it's Pareto, I guess, but it's really 95%. The number of outliers were rare that didn't have the same problems. Uh, and there were a couple, but there were very, very few. And most of those that weren't the outliers, almost all their problems were the same, with the exception 
of sometimes some added constraints in terms of dealing with hardware, dealing with regulation agencies, things of that nature. So I'm not going into what the GPS is per se, but you get the idea. You can look at how a system should work, see where it doesn't work, and that gives you the diagnosis that, oh, we got a problem here. Does that make sense? Even if you don't know how to do it, you get the idea that makes sense to do that. Except as far as I know, nobody does it but Amplio. So anyway, coming here, go back to this page. So what we do is, okay, now I know what's wrong. How do I fix it? <laughs> well, here's something that we realize at the same time. If everybody more or less looks the same way, well, this is what we first discovered was that everybody more or less doing the same thing. So what's that list of things? Well, that's where, that's where we have what we call these capabilities, that these are things you need to be able, that you need to be able to do. And that's where, that's where I've identified them. This took me a while. Um, capabilities at scale right here. And each of these capabilities, like, uh, you know, how do you plan? has one or more patterns associated with it to give you the means to figure out how to plan. Is it team planning, big room planning, flow planning, whatever. So what we have is if we diagnose what we are, we have a list of things we do and we can use patterns to provide the means, then we could use these to create a framework that has the ability to change. This is the key idea of Amplio's approach. I've been doing this for... I think it was around 2014 when I started creating this. I, I didn't call it Flex in that time. Flex was the second or third generation. The first generation was before I became an SPCT. It's just what we did kind of in an ad hoc way. I appreciated how SAFE gave you an answer and that was really needed. So when I stopped being an SPCT, I created what I called the inflection point system, which was all the decision points to make. And then I realized now there are actually a set of capabilities and have patterns to solve it. And now what you do is you create this adaptable framework. Now, this sounds like, oh my God, what, what is that is big, but it's not really. Let's go back. Let's go back to this. Like planning. Planning is kind of abstract. You have three different patterns. Oh, it gets more abstract. <laughs> My goodness. Except if you've got somebody who knows how to run the two, then what they do, working with you in what I call a collaborative engagement, you figure out, well, which pattern are you going to use? And then how are we going to define our solution? And that is part of your adaptable framework. For if I'm a big company and I'm doing safe, say probably the best thing I can do Oh, good. I'm in the right file, but I don't have a link to it. So let me find it. There is a better way to do planning than the way SAFE does planning. By the way, big room planning is an amazing event. If you've never been in one, you've missed something. I, I remember the first one I led. Uh, it was truly remarkable. The energy. I mean, it's like you get through 250 people in a room and they're all energized about solving problems they've never solved before. And management is watching and seeing this happen. It's it's really expletive deleted amazing. It is truly remarkable. It's the most collaborative thing I've ever seen in my life. The problem is it starts great and then it goes downhill from there. <laughs> but that event is really amazing. The thing that's missing in it is that it plans from the wrong thing. So you've got the different iterations, you've got your you've got your uh, teams. Uh, I'm a football fan, I guess you can tell if you know that those are football names. Uh, you plan by what you're going to release, not building it up by little tiny pieces. The safe doesn't have MVIs in it, so it's a problem. And then you see how you get it out there and you end up with the Los Angeles freeway map typically to start with. I didn't make up that. I didn't make that up. I was at a client. I was doing safe planning. We use red everywhere. They say to use red, but it's a lot easier when you use different colors. And uh, I remember we were doing the retro and this board was worse than this. It was just red everywhere. And somebody said, oh my God. And by the way, these guys were in Los Angeles. Uh, they said, oh, my God, it looks like the L.A. freeway map at rush hour. <laughs> These represent 
dependencies. And I thought, oh, crap, they're going to really dislike this. It's, at least now we see the trouble we're in. Yeah, but you don't want to just manage them. You want to eliminate them. So that's this whole point. That's this whole point that I'm going to bring what you said in, Tom, because you're absolutely right. The problem is you now can see where you are and you can make this decision to do it. But now, I think it was Einstein who says we can't solve the problems we have now, we can't solve today's problems with the solutions we use to get here. Okay. So you start out identifying your problems, but now how do you fix your problems? Well, once you've, once you've start removing the dependencies, once you start managing the dependencies, you're in a different situation. So you need this feedback loop is what you were mentioning, Thomas. You have to go and correct. Why? Not that this is wrong. See, this is the key piece that people seem to forget. This could be perfect for you at the time you're using it. But as you improve, it will necessarily not be perfect anymore. A good framework. A good framework can be defined by or seen by being good because as it improves the organization, it is no longer the best. It could be because the organization has changed. Questions about that? That's, that's actually a profound statement that doesn't seem to be accepted mm -hmm. in the industry. I claim you can get a really good fit-for-purpose framework but that if it's really good, it will shift the organization so that framework is no longer the best anymore. Let's talk about that for a minute, Thomas. Yeah, this again reminds me a little bit of the entire enterprise of science, right? That you have theories and you uh, look for falsification. You challenge right. the theory. And if you can and you falsify a theory, then you typically refine it or improve it. Or in some right. cases, uh, Kuhn's revolutions, right? You you discard an entire paradigm and, and start with something that's better. That's right. But that's the basic right. idea is it could be flawed. So let's find the flaws. And then when we do, then let's improve. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, That's important. The What is it? The, the, the scientific revolutions. What's the author on that one again? Wasn't that what you were referring Thomas to? Thomas Kuhn. The, yeah, the, Kuhn's. Um, the Structure of Scientific Revolution. Yes, yes. This is really a phenomenal book. I always forget the author's name. Uh, and progress... I don't, because I have the same first name. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it helps, actually. Yeah, yeah, Vanessa, and then I'll comment on this. Um. So my question is more related to a different... Um, maybe what this seen here on the screen... But it's in the other elements of that framework of Amplio, of um, flow, lean, and you know you have that also in the picture and the human center. All those components are integrated, I suppose, in the Amplio book, no? And the capabilities uh, and patterns, how to solve yeah, sort them. Of, sort of. Uh, they yeah. are and they're not. And I may have made a mistake in writing the, the way... <sighs> So, so when I started writing the Amplio Value Coach book, which is not on Amazon, but it is on uh, it is on uh, a Lean Pub. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when I started writing this, I, I was not as bold as I might have been. Uh, let's see, it's being an effective coach. The human-centered development is really well done. Uh, value coach, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's really cheap. I'm going to raise the price after I do some more updates to it. I'll get it on Amazon soon as well. But actually, I like LeanPub better because it's easier to get updates and things, although you might like the Kindle version better. But anyway... I intentionally, you notice there's not Amplio in the name, but it's actually based on the Amplio coaching model. And the reason I did that is I thought it would do more good to not identify it with a brand of mine or any brand. Well, not that I'm, you know, that there's something wrong with me, but 
I wanted it to be free of framework approaches or free of agile approaches. So I intentionally just talk about coaching. But in fact, this is another problem. The other problem is coaching is not a domainless ability. Okay, yeah, I have some skills and I can move coaching in one domain into another. I once shocked my wife when we were driving back from the airport and our Uber driver was one of these conspiracy theorist guys. And somehow I just decided to have have a conversation with him. And, and she was amazed how I just kept a level head and was talking to him and, you know, you know, looking and asking him questions. I said, well, look, this is my job. I, I talk to people about their belief systems. And, and the point is I could do that because I have the skill to do that. And I apply it in, in, uh, I apply that in amplio knowledge work. But the point is you're more effective when you know how to coach in the domain you're coaching. Like I was a great intramural football coach in college. I mean, I led my team to, we were, we upset everybody and everybody was shocked at it. You know, we didn't know we were a dorm team and nobody had ever, a dorm team had never beat the, the fraternities before. And we beat the number one fraternity. It's because we had a good defense and I knew how to coach people at their level, but I would be a horrible soccer coach. I'd be a horrible professional football coach. I don't know how to do that. So, you need to know how to coach in the domain you're in. That's really important. So I do sneak some Amplio stuff into this book, but it's intentionally been, you know, I talk about, that's why it starts out with foundations and things like that. But so that may have been a mistake, but I don't think I'm going to rewrite it. I just might write some tying together. That's where in Amplio University, you'll see in the, because I know you're in the university, is that when we talk about things, that's why I'm always injecting how to convey the ideas, because how to coach in a domain, how to coach this particular concept is important. Again, something left out of Agile. They don't do this. I've, I've been in the SAFE program consultant, but they don't teach you how to do consulting. They just teach you SAFE. And then they're saying, and now as a consultant, you'll do that. Well, that's not how to coach. They don't give it to you. The CSM, Certified Scrum Master Course. So I got my CSM from Ken. It was one of the best courses I've ever had. It had very little to do with Scrum. Almost all of us, we were told we had to read the Scrum book, his Scrum book first, Agile Software Development with Scrum. We all knew Scrum going in. He talked about coaching. He talked about being a Scrum master. It was a brilliant workshop, one of the best coaching workshops I've ever had. But it quickly devolved into a Scrum workshop having nothing to do with the Scrum master except listing their roles. Anyway, let's finish this up. And then I'm happy to stay because uh, if people want to keep talking, I'm good. So the thing here is we build an adaptable framework and it is adaptable, meaning, first of all, it was adapted to us. I could say adapted and adaptable. And then as we change, it changes. And as the company's needs change, it changes. And as we learn more, it changes. There's a, I don't know if there's a term for this, but you've all noticed this. Have you, when you go in and you learn something new, at first you're just trying to grab on to the basics and then you learn a little bit more and then you learn a little bit more. That, in other words, you can only jump so much. You know, your learning starts here and you can learn more and learn more. You might be introduced to things here, but it's beyond your grasp. But after you learn, you learn, you learn a little bit more. You know what I mean? There's this incremental learning that builds on what you know. I'll give you an example. So I'm an amateur sailor, small boats, really tiny ones, like eight foot, 10 foot boats. And when I first learned that, how to sail, what they tell you to do is look at this little string, the little flag on the top of your mast, you know, and that's because of the wind. You can see the wind. And, okay, great. Because sailboats don't have power. They go from the sail. You got to know where the wind is. And you first, you learn how to sail with the wind, against the wind, cross to the wind, and there are different sailing techniques, and it's not that hard to do. And if it's a calm day with a steady breeze, it's really easy. I don't know if I've ever been, I haven't, you rarely get a calm breeze, steady breeze in a sailboat. At least I haven't. There are gusts, there are all sorts of things. So at first, all you can grasp is the general flow of wind. But as you get better at sailing, you start reading about there's a way to tell before wind hits you. That sounds weird because you can't see wind, but you can see the effects of wind. Wind the general stream of wind will affect the waves, except you're not talking about general effects of wind, but they actually put ripples on the waves and you learn to look at the ripples on the waves. 
I can see wind before it hits me when I'm out in a sailboat. This is really useful because it lets me get closer to the edge. So you go faster when you lean the boat over. That's why you always see these races. The boats are way over. There's less hull. There's less resistance, less hull in the water. But if you're leaning over and you hit a gust of wind, you're in the water. <laughs> Not a good move. Okay. So you got to see the wind before it hits you. That's a cool skill. It's not hard, but you can't learn it at the beginning because you're going to be overloaded. You get cognitive overload if you give you everything. So this is the other reason this happens. The other reason this happens, it avoids cognitive overload. You get to start, you keep getting better and better and better. And the way I, the reason I have these here is because human centered development is important. That's what I have in the book on how people are. We have a lot of collaborative learning boards in uh, in the Ample University. Uh, I have them listed to some extent on the website. These are really good. These are to learn together, work together and make decisions together. Um, and then there's this mindset and things. And this is basically, I've made, I think, the case for why you need an adaptable framework. We said some very good reasons for it. And to be candid, I'm not sure why people don't think this way. Uh, and I guess maybe I just need to say it the way I said it here and not be caught up by the insanity of it, which uh, I, that's, that's why I have a life coach as she helps me not get caught up with the insanity of it. So this helped me. I think that's why I was in this weird mood because I know in the last few days I've been really caught up in the insanity of this. I've got one last thing I'm going to say and then I'm happy to stay a little later and answer questions. But here's something I've also learned as a coach. Okay, so I remember I started this conversation about this LinkedIn where this guy was talking about stories. Now, what's interesting is there were a variety of people who really liked my comment, but uh, and, and I know these people and I know they know what I'm talking about. They know I'm saying come from value. And then this, his conversation doesn't make much sense. Value delivered. And I disengage from the conversation because what I realize is they're filtering everything I'm saying into their process. So this is a big coaching tip here. This is what people do, by the way, is, is when you're not really hearing me, by the way, just I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I'm saying things that are triggering a conversation in your head, and that's what you're listening to, that conversation in the head. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's well, what conversation is he talking about? That's the conversation I'm talking about. You're running a, you have an ongoing commentary. And by the way, I do this too. This is called being a human being. This You can't get out of this. You, this is, you get out of it when they bury you or cremate you. You don't get out of this or actually just before. This is called human being. Here's why meditation is good, because it can slow this voice down. But I'm saying things, and you're ongoingly judging the voice. Like, is he right? What about this? Huh, Don Reinertsen and Theory of Constraints. I don't know I buy that. The voice is useful, but it's not us, and it goes on and on and on, and it sometimes makes it hard. See, Sometimes it's good thinking and sometimes it's actually based on a reaction from the past that we aren't even aware of, some trauma we had as a kid. That's called pushing. You ever you heard the phrase, you pushed my buttons? Yep. You said you Somebody said something that reactivated something in the past history of yours that happened unconsciously. Like I, I'm a decent driver. And actually, my wife sometimes remarks how good a driver and polite driver I am. And believe me, I was a killer driver when I drove in Boston. New York driving is like... It's kindergarten compared to Boston driving. Let me tell you, it's like even worse than French driving. And I know that because I scared the shit out of some French tourists that came over. A, a professor came over from Paris and I wasn't trying to scare him. I was driving normal. But <laughs> I said, well, if you get scared in Paris, <laughs> this, is just, this is Boston driving. <laughs> but anyway, I'm a nice driver now, but I still get upset when somebody passes me in a way I don't like. It's just an automatic response. I have nothing to do with it. I can decide whether I react to it or not. So this whole thing has to be observed. And this is why this also has to change slowly because we don't just jump in. We can't tell what it is and it reacts things. Okay, I'm done. I think this is really good. Um, uh, Tony, what did you mean by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Well, if uh, I can pick up where you left off, it, you mentioned as you are improving a system or a situation, 
Oh, the similar situation is changing, and what you did to do that is no longer really applicable. So in a way, it's like the observer is changing the observed. That's brilliant. I just this weird. I don't know. My brain is no, no, no. That's a brilliant insight. That's a, I just thought true. of that based on what you said. Yeah, no, that's true. That's a really good insight because you're changing the thing, and and we we're not necessarily aware. Oh, we've changed it. Now we might need to do something different. Yeah, it's also what was that uh, Hawthorne effect? Although Hawthorne effect, there's some yes. controversy about whether it really happened. Was the yeah. There was a factory in Hawthorne, that's where it gets the name from, where they made changes. And what they observed in the experiments they ran was that just the process of changing got results because people felt like at least they were dealing with my needs. Now, actually, there's the anti-Hawthorne effect. I'll coin a term here. Uh, the anti-Hawthorne effect, which is, oh, my God, another another um, uh, change of the month by our CEO. I wish they'd stop trying to do this. I, I should write a post on it. <laughs> Uh, so now the fact that you're changing it is sometimes pushes people's buttons like, oh, my God, we've been through this before. I'm going to wait it out. OK, any qu questions like I, I took I went through this in a different way, so I'm happy to end. But if anybody had any other questions, um, any other questions, that would be good to say now. I'm happy to. Are we good? Any comments on going forward? So going forward, the ACOP is going to have a dual role of providing more information plus plus uh, uh, you know uh, this the idea of in the AC in the Ampula University it'll give a way for people there to catch up and uh, just start noticing the voice in your head because I'll tell you what's worth doing because I made a comment here I, and I I didn't make this clear as I. Um, when I talked like, so sometimes we just get triggered and sometimes thoughts just come up, but sometimes we are actually looking at what was said versus what we know. And we're conscious of what the difference mm -hmm. that was said. And here's what we know. Cause I mentioned what Vanessa had brought up before about theory constraints and flow and see, that's a good conversation. So it's not like, it's not like the conversation in your head is bad, but just notice it's somewhat sometimes automatic. And sometimes it's you consciously looking at things. And when you become aware that this is going on, then you could act differently. So it's bad when it's automatic, like this guy passes me and I feel like I'm being cut in line. When he's in another lane, it just reminds me of that subconsciously. That's not so good. I have to take a breath, calm down. Hey, he's just, you know, this still happens. I just notice it and I let it go. Or that remember something and you look at it, then that's something to delve into. So it's it's like, it's not a bad voice. It's just, you got to notice it's a voice that is automatic some of the times and sometimes consciously. And this is why I like the choice so much. Anyway, mm -hmm. thanks for this. Any other comment? Vanessa, were you going to say something? I just saw your, oh. it came up. No, no, all no, good. Okay. All good. Because yeah, I love those kind of challenges and things. Uh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, take care. I'll get this up and I'm going to write out what the curriculum is because I'm going to think of it along these lines and I'll see y'all next Tuesday and some of you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Al. Bye.